Let's do it. Hey, everybody. We're recording. It's Julie Hoffman. I'm here with the amazing Mike Wolf. Say hi, Mike. Hello, everybody. And I see people coming in, and I'm really glad that you're coming in because tonight you're in for a real treat. So for those of you who don't know me all that well, although I think most of you do, I'm Julie Hoffman, a Street Smart Diva Real Estate Investment Coach, and I'm also uh, one of the founders of the Okanagan Real Estate Investment Group. And um, we get to talk about why would a person, why would a Canadian want to ever invest in the United States? Like there, we, we hear about it. There's seminars that come through town. Um, there's all kinds of, 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 of uh, events and programs out there and available. But let's talk to a Canadian who's done it and who actually trains Canadians on how to do it. That really, really speaks to me. So um, funny story. Back in, I think it was June, um, I got an email from this guy who I'd been kind of stalking online on Facebook, Mike Wolf. And I thought, huh, why is he emailing me? <laughs> and he had, I, I think he has a team member named Julie that's kind of like mine. And they were setting up a, a, an event, an, a meeting. And I emailed the back and said, hey, listen, hi there. Uh, I, uh, we don't, we haven't met yet, but I don't think I'm supposed to get this email. And he emailed me back and he said, actually, I've been thinking about emailing you. So this is good. And I'm like, I think it's good too. And, and we just, uh, so we set up a meeting, we booked right away. And then, um, we, we started having a conversation about, about the training that he does. Why invest in, in the United States uh, from a Canadian's perspective. And, um, I said, well, I'd love to have you out to to the Okanagan Real Estate Investment Group, OREG, okay? And he said, well, tell me when to be there and I'll be there. And I said, well, we're having a networking event this this like next uh, Thursday, I think it was. He's like, I'll come out for that. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I really like Kalani. I think we'd come out. I'm like, okay. And he did, he showed up at this party. He was at Wes Rosso's house. We, you know, it was a rooftop uh, OREG event and it was before, you know, we all got to, uh, told that we can't talk to each other anymore in person. And um, it was just amazing. I was like, wow, who is this guy that's who's willing to just uh, kind of drop everything and make the trip out to the Okanagan Valley? I know the Okanagan Valley is a great place. We we're just talking about how lovable it is, but it, it takes a special person to make that extra effort. So of course that impressed me. Um, and uh, I was, I remember speaking in, you know, he's, the more I talked to him, the, the more I knew he wanted, I wanted him to talk to my people. And so thank you to all of you who are here. And now I've been, I've spoken at big events. And the last time I spoke at a big event, um, I had to go on after this guy who had, who was talking, who was selling a big course and he was dialed into his presentation. And I'm telling you, he had the whitest teeth I'd ever seen. And by the end, and I had to go on after this guy, by the end of his presentation, which ran 45 minutes over time, by the way, the people that were signing up for it were marching around behind him with their credit cards raised in the air, so excited to take this course it, from an American about, uh, I think it was on tax deeds or something like that. I can't remember what it was, but I remember thinking, I have to go on now. This is crazy. And it was really unfair to me, but I'm mostly just telling that story because it was funny because I bombed. I didn't sell anything because I think he got everybody and he did a great job. And I hope people learned from him, but I know for sure he was not, um, he just wasn't Canadian. Um, so you're going to learn a lot tonight from Mike. Mike, oh, also there are going to be some bonuses. I have created something that I know for a fact works. Okay. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it works, but hopefully that what it'll, what it'll do, it'll help set you up for success with Mike. I know it will. I know it can. And um, we're excited to share with you what, what Mike has to offer. So this is going to be kind of like a Q and A. I've prepared some questions. If you have questions, I just need you to type them into the chat. All right. And um, if you're watching this recording, uh, there's probably a way for you to reach out to Mike and, and get some questions answered if, if things don't get covered in tonight's event. 
but it's going to be kind of it's going to be kind of casual. And I think that some of the um, questions that I have are likely questions that you also have. And it's kind of funny because I am from the United States. I was born and raised in Denver, Colorado. I met my husband in Mexico, who's Canadian, and blah blah blah. It's a whole big story. Um, but I I've never owned property in the United States. So. Um, First things first, what do you want to start with, Mike? Do you want to just kind of give everybody your history and then we'll we'll kind of get into the questions after that? Sure. Well, well first of all, thank you uh, for having me here. And I'm kind of now self-conscious about my teeth because you're talking about the guy with the whitest teeth. So, uh, so your, but, your teeth are not white compared to his. I know. It's very so, sad. But I anyway, tell. I do brush them every day and I try to floss. But And I know they're uh, white. I've seen you in person. But anyway. There you go. So. Yeah. So anyway, uh, first of all, wel welcome everybody. And uh, I am a Canadian, first of all. So uh, I'm from, I'm, I was born and raised in Montreal, lived there until I was 11, moved to Calgary at that time and sort of been there ever since. I became a nomad over the last uh, number of years. And right now I'm actually hunkered down in Mexico and until they change some rules to coming back in Canada, I won't be coming back for a while. But uh, in any case, I got started in real estate 100% by mistake. It was a very, uh, very fortunate mistake, kind of like how I met Julie, very fortunate mistake. And uh, I remember I was in the middle of grade 12 and I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up and didn't know what I was going to do the next year. And my parents were always driving into my brain, doctor, lawyer, doctor, lawyer. That's all I ever heard as a kid. And I am terrified of blood. So doctor was totally off the table from square one, but uh, lawyer sounded kind of cool because I, you know, you see those movies on TV and the lawyers are in their fancy offices and uh, maybe that look it looks very exciting, uh, at least in theory. And so went to University of Calgary, got my first degree. You see, there's no pre-law program, so I got my degree in psychology, and with that came a whole bunch of student loans. By the time I graduated uh, in 1989 from U of C, I had twenty-five thousand dollars in student loans, which to me seemed like an insurmountable amount of money that I would never be able to pay off in my entire lifetime. And so I thought before I go back and get my second degree, I'm going to get these things paid off. And I had a, uh, a good friend. His mother was a manager at the phone company, which this is really dating me. I guess I already did by saying I graduated in 89. But uh, his mother was a manager at Alberta Government Telephones, which is now Telus. And it was, you know, government, it was union, it paid really well. So I got a job there. And while I was there, I managed to build up my credit rating. You know, I was making pretty good money and bought my first property to my first home to live in. And shortly after I did that, my mortgage broker calls me up and says, hey, Mike, if you want, you know, I can get you a, uh, I can get you another mortgage if you want to buy another property. And I remember thinking, why do I want another property? And then he says to me, well, Mike, you buy another home, you put tenants in there, they pay your mortgage. And by the time, you know, 25 years from now, by the time that thing is paid off, that's your retirement. You got a clear title home, the money's gravy, rental will eventually go up, you'll make more cash flow. I thought that kind of makes sense. I had no idea, I had no inclination ever of becoming a real estate investor. And even when I bought this property, I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't know the due diligence. I didn't know how to pick a property. So I just thought, well, I'll buy something that looks pretty and that's close to where I live. So it's really easy to collect the rent. And that, so that's exactly what I did. That was my very first step into real estate. Now, as luck would have it, probably two years after I bought that property, the market in Calgary took off and things went crazy. And all of a sudden I was sitting on this equity, which is more money as, as an ex-university student. That was like more money than I ever thought I would ever see in a lifetime. And I did what any kid in their mid twenties, especially if you're a guy would do. And I just thought I, you know, my ego got the best of me. And I thought I knew everything there was no about real estate investing. So I promptly went and told my parents that I'm not going to be a lawyer. I'm not going back to get my second degree. I am now a real estate investor. I quit my job at the phone company, not really thinking that now I can't get any mortgages anymore. And uh, my ego really got the best of me. And uh, I wish I could say that everything after that went was just like that first deal where everything was just amazing. And every time I bought a property, it shot up in value. Uh, so I went from buying that first property, which was meant to be a 25 year hold. That's how, that's how my mortgage broker described it to now not having a job. I had some money in the bank, but I didn't want to wait two years for my next big paycheck. So I had to figure out how am I going to make my next paycheck? So I thought, well, how much tougher could it be 
to flip homes. Well, it turns out it's a lot tougher if you don't have any due diligence other than to pick something pretty and close to home. So needless to say on my next deal, I lost a lot of what I made on the first deal. And luckily I had some money left. I had enough left that I basically, I, I realized that, hey, there's people out there that are doing this and I wanna team up with them because I did not wanna tell my parents that they were right. My mother was telling me, Mike, you gotta go get your next degree. So you have something to fall back on. And then if you wanna pursue real estate, no problem, just get that degree. And I told her she was wrong and I could not go to my parents and tell them they were right. And so I have to figure this out. So after I lost a lot of my money, I did a, a joint venture with somebody who was successful at flipping homes. And I won't say everything was perfect after that, but I will say that my next deal after that made up for a lot of the lost ground that I had uh, uh, created for myself. And so that's, that was kind of the start of my real estate. Um, so I know probably your next logical question is how to get involved in US real estate. Yeah. So I did Canadian real estate for the first, I've been doing real estate now for 31 years. And the first half of my career was strictly in Calgary and surrounding areas. I never ventured out of province, never really went up even to Edmonton. I just stayed in Calgary, Okotoks, Airdrie, just close by. That's what I knew. And then a good friend of mine moved from Calgary to Las Vegas. He, he was a, still is a physiotherapist and got a really good job in Vegas. And so I would go visit him frequently because I had a free place to stay and who doesn't want to go hang out in Vegas. So I, I would go there frequently, but I have a different addiction than most people that would go to Las Vegas on a frequent basis. I'm not really much of a gambler. I'm not really that big a partier, but back in those days, I could not drive past an open house sign and not stop in. And every time I would go there, like I go there in November and the prices would be here. I go there in December, the prices would be here. I go there Jan like every single time I go there, the prices were going up. And at that time, Calgary was pretty flat. And so I was thinking, man, this is almost too good to be true. This is too easy. Now, back then I had no idea how to deal with the, the tax implications. How do you move money back and forth? There, there were so many things I did not know. And I could have easily said, okay, well, I'm gonna figure it all out and then I'm gonna jump in. And then I probably would have missed the opportunity. Instead, I jumped in and did very, very well there. I did very well in that market. And then I paid people to fix all the things I did wrong after, such as the taxes, and I got people to fix that. But that's how I got my start in the US. And once I, I started investing in the US, I found it very difficult to go back to Canada because in the US, the, the properties, especially these days, there's some markets that are much, much cheaper than even the, the probably the cheapest market in Canada that you could find. The return on investment is higher and there's just much more uh, opportunity because obviously it's 10 times the size in population, which means 10 times as many homes. So, when, and, and also the other thing that happened, obviously in the US, we all know about the great recession that happened 2007, 2008, and it created a massive opportunity. And while a lot of other investors were losing their shirt, I was uh, on the front lines. I was like a kid in a candy store. And uh, I was, as I mentioned in Vegas, and that market got hit the worst. It dropped 80% from its peak to its lowest point. So imagine a $200,000 home suddenly be worth, being worth 40 or 50,000 bucks. That's what was happening. And most people were getting fearful and they were, they were, they were steering away from real estate. And I was, I was going and picking up properties at auctions for pennies on the dollar. And that was really what helped me. It really took my career to a whole new level because when you're buying homes for 50 grand, as opposed to, I know in, in Kelowna, what probably average house, 600,000 maybe. Am I right? More? Do you, want to know, do you want to know the average sale price last month? I'm actually month? scared to ask. I'm scared. Well, you are sitting down. The average sale price of a single family home just last month was a million dollars. Seriously. I didn't know Kelowna is that much now. So you guys are up there with Vancouver almost. In that month, the, just so you know. Wow. So, but we are, we are talking, I think it's uh, late, I think it's around 758. It's, it's so here, really something. It's something. Well, yeah. The average in Calgary is probably 450, 500 and a home that in Calgary is 500,000 in Atlanta, which is my favorite market. And I actually sell turnkey properties there, mostly to Canadians. A home that's 500 grand in Calgary would be maybe 125 thousand in Atlanta, Georgia, which is a city of 5 million people. Calgary's a little bit over a million. It's five times the size, tons of jobs being created, and the homes are a fifth of the price. So, I mean, it's just a no-brainer. So I'm not saying you can't make money in Canada. You absolutely can. Uh, however, 
the barrier to entry. If, you, if maybe you're, you're sitting there and you're, you're thinking, oh, I wish I had more money. I can't, I can't get into a market that's a million bucks. Well, in the US, you can. And uh, you know, I, I was able to buy a lot more properties than I ever could have if I would have stayed in Canada. And so that's how I got started in real estate. That's how I got started in the US. And it's been, you know, 15 years of investing in the US now. And I've been through that, uh, you know, that great recession, did very, very well. I, I started off in Vegas and I started to invest in, uh, I, I made a lot of money in Vegas. Then it started, that market started to get competitive and saturated. I took my money, went to Phoenix, repeated it. I've done stuff in Florida. Uh, now I'm very big in Atlanta. We've done Kansas City, a lot of Texas. So I've done a lot of stuff in a lot of different places. So I really want to just come here and you know, answer as many questions as possible. And especially, I, I know what it's like to be a Canadian trying to work on the other side of the border. It's tough enough to do stuff close to home. And when you go across a border, it adds a whole level of complexity with trying to build teams and get people to show up. It's hard to get people to show up in the city you live in when you're there waiting for them, let alone when you're not there. So, uh, so I know a lot of you have a lot of questions. I know, Julie, you have questions. And I want to make it about you guys. This isn't about me. I want to make this as meaningful uh, for you as possible and give you the, a Canadian's perspective. Because one of the challenges is I've seen a lot of Americans try to teach how Canadians can invest in the US and they assume we're exactly the same. They assume that if we do the exact same things they do, we're gonna get the exact same result and nothing can be further from the truth, especially with the taxes. So a lot of Americans will come up to Canada and they'll say, oh, just get an LLC, which is a limited liability corporation. An LLC is really, really good for Americans. It's horrible for Canadians. Because, and I'll just go over it really quickly. An LLC is what's called a pass-through entity. And what that means is your LLC doesn't pay tax for you. The money flows through to somewhere else. And if all you have is that LLC, the only place it can flow through to is you. And if it flows through to you, now all of a sudden the CRA wants to tax you and the IRS wants to tax you. And now you're going to get deal with things such as double taxation, withholding taxes. So that's why I really love to speak to other Canadians because if you listen to what the Amer most Americans will teach you, they don't take the time to learn the nuances that us Canadians have to deal with. They just want to sell you into some That's sort of uh, some sort of class, take your money, and then they don't care what really happens to you after. So I like to clarify uh, as much as possible. So uh, so I'm an open book. You guys can ask me absolutely anything, and I'm happy to answer it. And like I said, I have a lot of experience in a lot of different markets and a lot of different strategies, everything from tax deeds to, to flipping to wholesaling. Uh, have my turnkey operation, like I mentioned, Atlanta, you name it, I've probably done it. And if I haven't, I will uh, get back to you and fi I'll find out the answer for you and get back to you. So happy to do that. Awesome. Well, I'm going to start and I'm looking, I'm looking out for chats, you guys. So um, I, I find a lot of times, Mike, my people, people that, and I, I've got a few regulars on there, uh, on here, and I'm so happy to see all of you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, Mike, are you holding both a Canadian and American citizenship? No. So I am in the exact same boat most of you are probably in. I am a Canadian. I don't have a work visa in the States. I don't have a green card. I don't live in the States. Uh, so I'm in exactly the same position I assume most of you are in, except for maybe Julie, who has, you probably still have American citizenship too, dual. Yeah. So. So you actually have yeah. an advantage over me. I don't have that. So anything that I'm telling you that I've done is something that you could potentially do too. Yeah. And um, I think that's a really good question. He, uh, um, Hatem, Hatem, I'm doing my best pronouncing your name. I like it. Mr. S, we uh, wonder, wondering how taxes work. Should we dive right into that right now? You want to just talk taxes? Yeah, right well, if people ask it, I will answer it. So let's just answer all, it. Yeah, great yeah, question. Yeah, it's a great question. And that's actually one of the things I did not know when I first started investing in the US. And it's something that I, I eventually, one thing I don't like doing is sending the government more money than I have to. So it's one thing that I immediately took care of after I paid too much uh, tax the first uh, year or two. And so the first thing you need to know is that taxes are very individual. It's not one size fits all. So it's kind of like if you went to, if you went, imagine you went to the doctor and, the, and you said, hey doc, here's what's wrong with you. And the doctor said, oh, I don't need to know. I just give everybody this one, you know, this one green pill, just take this pill. It's like, it doesn't work like that. Every single person that goes in there, if you go into your accountant, hopefully your accountant is asking you a bunch of questions. 
And when it comes to real estate, even if you're doing real estate in Canada, it shouldn't be one size fits all. If you're, if you're flipping properties, for example, you're going to have different tax consequences than if you're buying and holding because passive income is treated differently than earned income. And so one, it's not one size fits all. Two, disclosure, I am not an accountant. I don't play one on TV. I never wanted to be an accountant. My parents, that was the third thing they wanted me to be. Uh, that was never something anyway. So we're not gonna go there, but, but I, I will tell you that there are solutions for every, every Canadian, but your solution might be different than my solution. So in general, uh, LLCs are not the best structure, as I mentioned earlier, because they don't pay tax. If they don't pay tax somewhere, that means the money is flowing through to you and you're going to pay, there's going to be two governments that are going to want a piece of that from you. So uh, one choice is something called a C-Corp. A C-Corp is uh, it's basically a, a U.S. entity and that will pay uh, mostly tax. You're going to pay tax in the U.S. It will pay tax for you. And in Canada, once again, I'm not an accountant, so check with your accountant, confirm everything that I tell you, but your, your C-Corp will pay tax for you in the U.S., which means that now at least you're not going to be subject to withholding taxes. Now, what are withholding taxes? If you go do a deal and make money, the U.S. government has no idea. If you're a Canadian, they don't know who you are. You're not in their tax system. And so there's two ways to get in the tax system. One is to set up a corporation, which is quite often the better way. But the other way, especially if you're only going to do maybe one transaction, instead of setting up a whole corporation, you might just want to do the first one in your personal name. And that may or may not be a good idea. Once again, talk to your accountant, lawyer, et cetera. Uh, and then you're going to get what's called an ITIN number, I-T-I-N, which, uh, what does it stand for? It's, uh, anyways, your, your tax identification number. And that basically means that you're voluntarily putting yourself into the IRS's tax system, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, but what it does now, they know who you are. They know how to contact you. They know how to come and arrest you if you don't pay your taxes and they're happy. And now they won't withhold money from you. If you go do a deal and they don't know who you are and it's in your personal name and you're a foreigner and they know you're up in Canada. There was a pretty good chance you might, it might slip your mind to pay the taxes and they don't really know how to track you down. And so they're going to, from your transaction, they're going to withhold a bunch of money. And when you file your tax return, then they'll but give you back whatever they owe you. Here with the way, the way you talk. talk. Oh, oh, oops, I hear a... Mike, I don't know what happened there. So, sorry, repeat that. Oh, it's all good. Something yeah. happened. Okay, <laughs> but it, it happens. So, so anyway, it's, uh, uh, it basically tells the government, hey, we don't have to withhold money from this person because we know who he is. We know how to track him down. And so that's the second way is an ITIN number. And so not everybody needs to have a, you know, I, I get this question a lot. Should I get a, set up a corporation first? There's two reasons why you would set up a corporation in any country, not just the US and Canada too. There's, you could easily buy a house in Canada under your personal name to flip or to hold. And people do that. And depending on your situation, that might or might not be a good idea. There's two reasons why you would set up a uh, entity of some sort. And number one is for asset protection. If somebody sues you and, you know, if somebody came to me and said, hey, Mike, I own six apartment buildings and uh, an industrial space and, you know, a jet. And for somebody like that, yes, you don't want to buy in your personal name because all that stuff is in one bucket. And if somebody decides to sue you, they can go after all your assets. So number one reason why you set this up is for asset protection. The second reason you set it up is to save money. And so, so number one, if you, if you don't have anything, you're starting off where I did 31 years ago and I had zero, I was negative. There's no point setting up a corporation. If somebody wants to sue me, what are they gonna get? I had nothing, there was nothing to take from me. So, so that's the number one reason. The number two reason is because you can quite often save money on your income taxes. And if you're doing your first deal, pretty good chance you're not going to, you're going to have a lot of write-offs anyway, especially if you're taking training on how to do it, or if you're traveling back and forth, or, or you have to invest in setting up teams. In any case, you're going to get a lot of write-offs early on in your career, and so you might or might not need that. And so, so that's why I say it's not one size fits all. Everybody's in a different boat. And so I'd recommend not just talking to your accountant, you need to speak to a cross-border specialist. Now, if you go to an accountant in Canada and you say, hey, I want to do some deals in the U.S., pretty good chance they might say, oh, no problem, we can help you with that. And then as soon as you leave their office, they're going to call an American accountant and try to figure out how to mesh two systems together that aren't really necessarily meant to mesh that well. Uh, if you go to an American accountant, they're going to do the exact same thing. They're going to call up a Canadian accountant, and try to compare notes and figure it out. Uh, a much better way is to hire somebody who's known as a cross-border accountant. And cross-border accountants have training on both sides of the border. I can connect you with people like that, by the way, no problem. But those people already know 
how the systems work and the most strategic ways for you to set up uh, your entities, if at all. And those are the people you want to talk to because like I said, I don't have the right designation to give you legal or accounting advice, but I will tell you that that the tax part is a, the biggest hurdle for a lot of Canadians and it shouldn't be because it's easily solvable and it doesn't have to be solved by you. You just have to get the right person on your team, have a couple of quick phone calls, and then you're, you're in the game. And the other thing I'll tell you is that in my opinion, the US tax system is a lot less punitive than the CRA. And I actually pay less tax doing deals in the US than I did when I did very similar transactions in Canada. And once again, make sure you talk to an accountant, have yourself structured properly to take advantage of that because if you're not structured properly you may not have that experience but um, not only do i make more money in the in the us but i get to keep a lot more of it and so that's that's been very beneficial but that's a long way of saying that everybody's in a different boat and it's not one size fits all so if you ever go to a seminar especially if it's put on by an american and they say oh everybody just needs an llc or everybody just needs a c corp or everybody just needs a limited partnership run because if you start giving advice to everybody, uh, very, very dangerous. Make sure you talk to somebody about your personal situation and get the proper structure. And that will be worth its weight in gold. It's gonna save you a lot of money and also protect you from lawsuits and, and people trying to get at your assets. Although I've never had that happen by the way. And none of the investors that I know, uh, you know, we a lot of these lawyers, no offense if there's any lawyers on here, but a lot of these lawyers like to sell you these really fancy three-tier structures. I don't know personally anybody who's been sued and I've been doing real estate for a long time. So I'm not saying to just totally ignore it, but also don't, there's a lot of people that say, oh, the US is so litigious. Well, yeah, if you're Walmart or Starbucks, somebody's gonna sue you if they spill coffee on themselves because they know these companies have very deep pockets and that they will pay to settle out of court. Uh, people don't normally, at least in my experience, sue their landlords or sue the person they bought the home from. I, ha I haven't seen a lot of that, Not, none for me, none for my friends. So don't also don't get suckered into spending $100,000 because you're worried you're going to get sued. It doesn't have to be that fancy. So that's my advice as a non-lawyer, non-accountant. That's just great advice. Um, and uh, I'll tell you what kind of degree my mom wanted me to get when I went to university. She wanted me to get an MRS degree. MRS, what, what is that? She wanted me to find a husband who was oh. preferably a doctor <laughs> or a lawyer or, a, or an accountant. Well, or if I was in school, it would have been your target audience. So, <laughs> but luckily I quit. And now you found your, your special husband. So that's good. Yes. And um, oh, she was horrified, but that's a whole other webinar. <laughs> she didn't want me moving to Canada. It's all okay. It all ended up working out okay. Anyway, um, so we have we have more questions. I, I'm not going to use mine. Well, actually, I will. I'll use one of them because we've talked about it already. Um, I remember learning about Nevada corporations. And um, I remember this was a long time ago. So, you know, excuse my ignorance if, if it, this is what's happening. But... Um, because, because taxes are different in Nevada, we were recommended to start a Nevada corporation if we were gonna go down and start doing tax deeds or, or tax liens, which by the way, we could talk about this too. They seem easier. Tax liens, tax deeds seem easier in the US than what I've seen and heard about experiencing in Canada. So I guess it's kind of a two part question. What's the deal with this Nevada corporation stuff? Is it mumbo jumbo or is it for real? Yeah, well, um, there's three, if you were to talk to an accountant and I recommend that you all do, if you were to talk to an accountant and say, hey, all things being equal, where should I set up my corporation? Depending on who you talk to, they're probably gonna tell you Nevada, Delaware or Wyoming. Those are the three places that are most uh, tax advantaged okay. and also give you the most uh, asset protection. And so if you think about Las Vegas, who set up Las Vegas back in the days? It was a mobster, right? It was, a, it was, it was the, uh, the mob. And so who do you think would really want their anonymity protected with their assets? N nobody more than, than gangsters would want their to be protected from, from you know, people trying to come after all the stuff that they were uh, collecting, such as you know, property and casinos and, and whatever. So yeah, so Nevada is known to have very favorable uh, laws in favor of asset protection which is why people pick there. Uh, Wyoming, uh, similar, not because of the mob, but they just have very, very good uh, asset protection. Both of them are, are really good 
in terms of having relatively low uh, tax rates. And Delaware, uh, from what I understand, once again, as a non-accountant, but Delaware seems to be really good for really big corporations. Not so much, I think, for us as small investors. So I don't really hear too, too, many, uh, too many real estate investors that are being put into Delaware. But if you're a Walmart, you want to be in, in Delaware, apparently. So it's really good for protection for big companies. Um, now, the, the other side of it is, let's say you are doing one of my favorite strategies. And I know you mentioned auctions, so I'll talk about that really quickly. And then we'll go in more detail in a minute. But one of my favorite places to do auctions is in Houston, Texas. And they have something there called tax deeds. And a tax deed is when somebody hasn't paid their property taxes in a number of years, the county needs that money to keep their schools open and pay for their police force and their hospitals. They need that cash. And it's got to come from somewhere. And in Texas, they have no state income tax. So instead, it comes from property tax. The property taxes are very high. And a lot of properties end up on the auction block because of that. So if you're doing all your investing in a place like Texas and your corporation is in Nevada, at some point, the state government may say, hey, well, you know, you're, you're buying, you're doing an awful lot of work here. Are, are you sure you're really a Nevada corporation? And so sometimes that'll get challenged. And sometimes you have to just register with the secretary of state. Other times you have to set up an individual corporation there. So once again, that's the importance of talking to somebody who specializes in this, because you may set up something that's really advantaged and then invest somewhere else, and they may not allow what you've done. And so once again, always talk to your uh, your accountants and your, your lawyers and get, uh, but in general, those those are the best places, uh, all things being equal, if you, can, if you can set up there. I'm actually structured in Nevada myself. Uh, so in general, that is good advice, but once again, don't just say, hey, well, Mike and Julia were talking about Nevada. I'm gonna go set up in Nevada, talk to your, no. uh, Talk to the right people first with the right de right letters after their name, uh, like MRS or whatever, or CPA <laughs> or whatever it is, but talk to those right people that are trained in the thing that you need to know. It's worth to invest a little bit of extra money up front before you jump in than to try to set up something and then have to disband it later and set up something different later. So, so that'd be my advice. Now, second part of your question was uh, auctions in the US compared to Canada and I can tell you that there is way more, the, the biggest difference is really not, not just the, the quantity, the, the difference goes back to the fact that in Canada we have CMHC and CMHC basically tells the banks that if you foreclose on a property, you have to try to get market value for it. Now, as a homeowner in Canada, I'm grateful for that because if my home's worth a million dollars and the one next to me all of a sudden is foreclosed on and they sell it for half a million, well, now that's created a new comparable on my block. And now my home, because of that home, has just gone down half a million bucks, just like that, one second. And so as a homeowner, I'm very, very grateful they don't do that. In the States, it's not like that. The banks can do whatever they want. And they can sell a property for whatever they need to to recover their, their, their money. Now, as an investor, I'm not happy about that. As a homeowner, I'm happy. As an investor, I'm not happy because there's very little inventory. And when, when a home goes in foreclosure in Canada, it's not usually a good deal anymore. The bank is selling it at market value. If it ever goes to an auction, there's so few auctions and so few properties that in my experience, they end up going for market value, sometimes more than market value anyways. Now in, in Canada, if I was going to work strictly in Canada, how do you make your money? You go after pre-foreclosure. You go after the homes before the bank has taken it back, negotiate with the homeowner. That's how you do a deal. In the US, we have the advantage. We can go after pre-foreclosure and we can go after the foreclosures because the banks are willing to negotiate. They're willing to do things like short sales, which means they're willing to cut down the amount of that mortgage in order to get it sold sometimes. And there, and there's some of the advantages, some of the reasons why I love investing in the US. It just opens up more opportunities. And so uh, there, there's auctions all over the US that take place regularly. I've had clients, uh, you know, one of the things that I did pre-COVID is I did live trainings in Houston, Texas. And we'd spend four days together I take people to the auctions and I had one of my students pick up just as an example, a home for 7,200 bucks worth probably 90 to a hundred thousand dollars. Now that isn't even a down payment on a shed, probably anywhere in Canada. I don't know anywhere in Canada where that would even be a down payment. I just, on a I just saw a shed for sale. <laughs> you know, what, what was the down payment? It was it's around 72. I'm you telling go. you, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's high here. I know, I know it. And so, you know, it's, no. it's, a, it's, uh, there's these auctions normally when there's no COVID, they take place every single month. 
And like in, in Texas, the first Tuesday of every month, there's these tax deed auctions and there's some phenomenal deals. Now, for those of you listening, don't just go uh, jump in. Do not go to the auction until you know what you're doing because there's a lot of good deals. There's also a lot of really bad deals. And I've also seen a lot of people lose a lot of money. Now, one of the things you need to know is in theory, the mortgages are supposed to disappear off these properties. So if you pay 7,200 bucks, that's it. You get the home clear title, it's free and clear, no liens on it. Now there's exceptions to that. If you don't know what those exceptions are, for example, well, now you might get the home for 7,200 bucks and get a call from Bank of America or Chase the next day saying, hey, there's a mortgage on here for you know $100,000. How do you plan on paying for that? And now all of a sudden, you're in a bit of a bind that you weren't expecting. And so I've seen a lot of people lose a lot of money. And I've seen a lot of people make a lot of money. So make sure you know what you're doing. But the, bo the bottom line is uh, when you go to these auctions and you know what you're doing, there's, there's some great opportunity there that does not exist anywhere in Canada that I'm aware of. So I, I don't know every market in Canada. So forgive me if you live somewhere and, and you've seen a great auction, but I don't know of any of my uh, investor friends that have made money at an auction in Canada. I know a lot of people in real estate. Well, um, of course you do if you've been doing this for 30 years and 15 of it in Calgary, which like Alberta real estate investors, they're just, they're special folks, you know, and, and we go to places and we try to set those places on fire too, you know, and it's interesting. Like when we moved to Kelowna, it was, it was a different game. It was like, who are you? And it's like, I just, well, I'm a girl who wants to do real estate and the way, hang on, hang on, we're going to. We're going to check you out first. And I'm like, oh, man. OK. Uh, you know, so that's how it can kind of be. Um, I want to speak to the the auction side of things. And the, you talked about shorting uh, shorting the note or short, shorting the mortgage. Is that what you called it? Basically, the mortgage. Yeah, basically doing a short sale means that. Yeah, short sale. Sorry, short sale. So it's so funny. And I mean, I took Ron Legrand training twice. He is an American and he came up and totally like, and his training I put into action and it worked incredibly well. It really did. But I had to self-Canadianize a lot of things. Right. And right. I remember getting a house, getting the deed. That's what Ron said. You got to transfer title, get, get title, you got everything. And so I went and I did that really not knowing what I was doing, but I did it. And I, and there was two, there were two mortgages on it. So uh -oh. I called up the mortgage company and said, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to renegotiate the second mortgage. I, I'd like a discount on it. And they're like, well, that's nice. Good for you. I'd like the sky to be green today. <laughs> um, that's not going to happen either. And I, it was a rude awakening. Fortunately, there was enough equity in the deal that I, that we were able to figure it out, but it was kind of a rude awakening. It was but like, here's what, this yeah. is not working Canada. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, what I would do differently is, you know, if you're doing a short sale, you negotiate with the lender first. Uh, because once, if you take over, if you take over the existing mortgage, they have no reason to negotiate with you. You already just took it over and you're on the hook for it. So they have no, they have absolutely no desire to negotiate. Just like they want the, the sky to be green. That's great. They, yeah. they, they, they now have you, but if you're in the position where, this thing is going into foreclosure and the banks of course don't want a foreclosure on their books. It doesn't look good for them. And you negotiate with them before you transfer that in your name, then you've got a lot of leverage at that point. So it's all how you, it's, it's these little minor nuances that make all the difference sometimes. It was an interesting process. It all works out. But that's how you learn, right? If it didn't kill you, it makes you stronger and a smarter investor. So there so you go. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Okay. We, we have some great questions coming in. Um, from again, Mr. S, you mentioned you wish you had both citizenships. Is there any advantage for having an American citizenship as a Canadian real estate investor in the States? What what are well, the advantages? The, you mentioned that. Yeah. The, well, the biggest advantage if you had both would be you don't have to jump through quite as many hoops to minimize what you're paying the CRA. You can take them, you obviously take them right out of the equation. Uh, in, in general, though, there's not that many advantages. I can do almost everything that an American can, only I've got to be a little bit more mindful of the Canadian tax system, et cetera, and make sure that uh, you know, I'm, I'm not having to you know, give them the pound of flesh that they like. Uh, but if you're, if you're structured properly and you set everything up, how your account, your cross-border specialist tells you, you can enjoy almost everything that an American can. So uh, 
in, in all honesty, it's not, it's not that it's not that tough to be a Canadian investing in the U.S. And it's just it's just some minor little things that you have to do differently. But there's it's worth doing those extra things, in my opinion, because of how how much more opportunity there is, how how much cheaper the properties are. It's, it's just easy. It's just easier all around. And um, you know, since since I started investing in the U.S., I have not bought just uh, I haven't bought anything in Canada in the last 15 years. Everything I've done has been in the U.S. because it's just it's just cheaper, higher ROI, easier, and I I keep a lot more of what I make down there. Put it that way. It's interesting. It, it leads into this uh, this next question, which is uh, from Trina. Hey, Trina. Um, how does the exchange rate factor into your investments and returns? You're just all in U.S. money now, so it's probably not a big thing. But it is for us Canadians. In using Canadian dollars, it's a thirty percent bump, right? It is. But the good news is, assuming you're trying to make money, your profit is also a thirty percent bump, and your monthly rent is also a thirty cent bump. And after a while, like when you first do your first deal and you have to make that first exchange, it kind of hurts a little bit. I'll be honest, it hurt me. But when I started to make my paychecks in U.S., I started to accumulate more and more U.S. dollars. It actually led to a whole new revenue stream for me. So let me give you an example. You know, when, when I make money in the U.S., I keep it in U.S. dollars. When I make money in Canadian dollars, I keep it in Canada. And when the dollar goes one direction too far, it's like a rubber band. Like when the Canadian dollar gets back to par with U.S., which happens every now and then, not very often, but it does happen every now and then, I switch a lot of money over when the Canadian dollar gets really strong. Conversely, when the U.S. dollar, when the US dollar gets really strong and we get really weak, then I move a bunch of money back the other way. Some years I make more money exchanging, you know, my, my U.S. into Canadian and vice versa than I ever did going to a job all year long. Now I know some of you are, if you start investing in the U.S., you're going to have to maybe take some money back uh, to live off of or pay bills, etc. And you know that's just the cost of doing business. But if you wait, like I've had people that I remember 2007, 2008, I was telling people this is like the gold rush. There was going to be so much, there was so much opportunity. And I was going back in those days, I was going to the auction. There was an auction in Las Vegas. It used to happen Monday to Friday, nine to five. There's so many foreclosures. And when I first started going there, there were maybe like five people. It was in this parking lot. There were like five people. And we all kind of like deal with each other. I say, hey, you let me have this property. I won't compete against you on that property. We've been making deals in the parking lot. As time went on, that five five people became 10 and 20 and 100 and 200, and this parking lot was jam-packed. And so the reason I tell you this is there's never going to be a time where all the stars are aligned, where the Canadian dollar is at par and home, homes are on sale and interest rates are low and you just won the million dollar lottery. It's never going to happen where every single thing is aligned. So at some point, you, you can either take the plunge now and Take, it's going to feel painful until you get that first paycheck and it's going to be like, oh, I like these US dollars. But it's going to be a little painful at first. But if you keep waiting for the dollar to get to where you want it to be, well, something else isn't going to be perfect. You're going to keep stalling. And you're never going to take action. So just take the sting right now. If, if this is something you want to do, don't uh, don't hold off for all the plans to land because it's not going to happen. And by then you would have missed out on how many deals. So keep in mind that you're, you're not losing that money. If you're paying 30% more, you're probably going to make 30% more. Occasional fluctuate. Sometimes it'll go a little bit this way or that way. But over time, it's going to dollar cost average itself out anyway. So just don't let that stop you. And I'm, I'm so grateful now because I'm, I love getting paid in US dollars. And I especially love whenever I come back to Canada and I go to a restaurant, the prices are the same as in US restaurants. So I order something that's 10 bucks, but I'm putting it on my US credit card. It's like seven bucks. So I love it. So I feel, I feel like a kid in a candy store whenever I come back to Canada and you can too, but you got to take the plunge and get started. And right now, actually the Canadian dollar is actually pretty, pretty strong relatively speaking compared to where it's been. So, uh, so maybe the planets are all aligning right now because this COVID is causing crazy stuff to happen. But uh, yeah, the first time you do it, there's no way around it. You're going to have to have us dollars, simple as that, but you can also leverage and borrow a bunch of us dollars and then Pay it back when if, if you want to pay it back. I'm a big fan of, of leverage, but if you want to pay it back, pay it back when it's favorable for you to do so. And uh, you can actually play with this currency and, and create a whole other revenue stream from it. And I've, I've done uh, very well with it because I'm not desperate to move the money. I only do it when it makes sense to do so. And so I, I love the currency exchange. I love fluctuation. But for you guys just starting out, 
take the plunge. If, if this is something you want to do, take the plunge. That's all I got to say. And if you buy, if you buy a home for $7,200 and you have to pay an extra 30% because you have to convert your currency, think of the 992,000 bucks you saved for buying a home in Kelowna. That, that'll, that'll make, take the sting out of it for sure. Hey. How does hey. that sound? I know. That I'm was being, cold. I'm being mean. I'm being mean now, but I'm just being real. Like when I, whenever I go back to Calgary, and and it's not as expensive as Kelowna or Vancouver, but it's still pretty expensive. It's like, why are people paying these prices? Like I can't. I I, I have a hard time understanding it because you know once you get used to these numbers in in the, a lot of the markets that I work in, like I, I would never pay that again. I, I I'm just gonna be if I move back to Calgary. I still own a property that I've got renters in, but if I ever bought another property to live in, I wouldn't. I'm just I'm going to rent, and uh, like the economy is so bad, and people are still paying those prices. Where's that I, anyway? Don't even get me on that tangent. I'm going to drop it. Well, that's a whole other webinar. It just that is. is a whole other well, webinar. The fact of the matter is, anybody that's listening to this or here tonight, it's because they are looking for options because they feel the same way that you do, right? And that's why we did this. It's because, okay, I, I I can't find something that I think will work in my backyard. Maybe this is an option and this is why we're here. And, you know, I just believe it's going to cost either way. You know, just like, just like people will pay for a, a, a university degree, go into student debt in order to get a degree and spend four years of their life, most of it probably partying. And to get a, you know, to get a degree, um, why wouldn't you spend some time and resources and take some, you know, it's again, it's going to cost you the way it's going to be opportunity costs. It could be money out of your pocket, but wouldn't you rather learn something that, yeah, you can do over and over and over and over again. That's just the way I see it. And that's how I, that's how I feel about real estate in general. And I like the Canadian market. I like some aspects of it. I definitely do. But that leads into some really good, we're getting great questions, by the way, from. Yeah, these are all great questions. Absolutely. You mentioned, though, you talked a little bit about leverage. So I always am curious, do Canadians always have to come down and plunk out cash for all these deals? And or how does financing work for Canadian residents and citizens investing in the U.S.? What's what's that all about? All right, so I'm going to give you some different options. Uh, the, the first one is uh, basically taking equity out of what you already have in Canada, borrowing, borrowing against your property, doing a HELOC, et cetera, getting lines of credit, uh, things like that. That's your first and probably cheapest uh, path to getting cash. Uh, your second best option, there are several Canadian banks that have U.S. subsidiaries, and I personally like RBC. Uh, we, we sell a lot of our turnkey properties to Canadians in Atlanta, and we've used RBC many, many times, and they will base their decision on your Canadian credit score. Uh, the, they don't care that you don't have a social security number in the States. They don't care that you have any credit. They don't care that you don't have any credit in the States. They just care about your, your history back home here in Canada. And I believe TD does similar in Bank of Montreal, but RBC is one that I have personally had the most luck with. So that's definitely another option. When times are good, there's banks in the US that will lend to Canadians too and other foreign nationals. Right now, my experiences are pretty tight. Usually when things are bad, like when there's COVID and when they're, you know, we have a minor pandemic going around or a major uh, recession, they sometimes tighten up their purse strings a little bit and they cut off some of the programs. But when things are good, they'll actually loan to foreign nationals. Right now, I don't personally know of any US lenders that are doing that. But I, I, I would start off with, our, uh, well, first, like I said, try to get a HELOC or other money on, if you have some equity at home, do that because that's cheap, cheap, cheap money. Uh, and then of course, raising private money, you can do that as well, especially if you have great deals. Imagine you told somebody, hey, I know how I can get properties for 7,200 bucks. Are you willing to, you know, I want to buy a whole bunch of properties. Are you willing to partner up with me? That's a lot different than saying, hey, I need a million bucks to, to get started in real estate. So it's a different conversation. So private money is also another great option. But in all honesty, our RBC has been really, really good. You want to talk to, uh, there's some cross-border specialists at RBC located in the U.S. And by the way, every, every, uh, can, is it okay if I give people my email address? Because I can put oh you in gosh, touch. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's Mike at MikeWolfMastery.com. Mike at MikeWolfMastery.com. And I can put you in touch if you need to talk to somebody at RBC. Uh, it, I have people, they're south of the borders where you can't just go into your branch in Kelowna. They won't know what the heck you're talking about. 
But if you if you go uh, and talk to some of these people that are, are cross border specialists, they can uh, you know take a look at your credit. They I, I believe with RBC they want you to be a client of theirs, so you might have to open up a savings account, which is of course super easy to do. Uh, I don't think there's any. I don't know if there's a minimum amount you have to put in. So that's a question for them. And I know some people are going to ask about interest rates. I don't know other than they're they're favorable. A lot of my clients have used them because the rates were were pretty decent, and. Uh, uh, so I would start that conversation uh, with them first. And then if that doesn't work, uh, which if you have good credit, probably would based on what I've seen, then I would start looking at, uh, at private money. And when you start talking about U.S. investing and uh, where the numbers are much smaller, you're asking for much smaller amounts. So it's easier to have that conversation, I find. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. It totally answers my question. I Yeah, BMO and TD, I know are down there. I know that they are. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think it's TD Waterhouse that's down there, and um, BMO Harris is, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, and which I very well could be, because Mike is the expert here. No, I, I, you're, you're you're correct, and I think okay. some of them only lend in certain states. So depending on where you want to invest, you might have to talk to some different lenders. I know in Atlanta, we've used uh, RBC with great success. I haven't I haven't used TD or Bank of Montreal personally. So I can't speak from experience on that, but uh, I know they lend in certain parts of the U.S. as well. Okay, perfect. So um, any property deals in Florida? We are being asked by AJ. Thanks for the question, AJ. What do you think I, about AJ, Florida, um, Mike? Yeah, well, just like every city has deals. So it depends on how you define deals. Um, if you're looking to buy and hold, that ship kind of already sailed in some ways. The prices have gone up considerably, but the rents haven't. If you're looking to flip, you can flip absolutely anywhere if you if you have the right connections to start you know searching for deals or, or, or doing the right uh, you know steps to attract uh, to attract sellers. Uh, but if if you're looking for good return on investment, I'd, I'd recommend like I, I I personally love Atlanta. You want you want markets. Actually, let me give you a clue as to what I see happening here with this COVID uh, stuff that's going on. We're we're seeing a, a massive trend. Both in not just in the U.S. but Canada as well, of people leaving expensive places and going to cheaper places. Like in, a lot of people I heard in Toronto, for example, they're leaving uh, the city and going more to the burbs, and uh, that's happening in a lot of major centers because people are realizing, hey, we don't have to go to the office anymore, so we don't have to worry about the commutes. So let's go where it's cheaper, where we get more house for our money. So that's one of the trends in the U.S. They tend to be a little bit more aggressive with that, where they'll actually leave the city they live in, not just go to the burbs but they'll go somewhere where there's jobs being created. They'll go somewhere where the taxes are more favorable. So right now I personally know of at least 10 people that have left or are leaving California and they're going to places like Texas because the, uh, the state income tax in California is off the charts, it's ridiculous. And so they're going to Texas where there is no state income tax, where the homes are a fraction of what they are in California. They're also going to Idaho, they're going of all places. Uh, they're going to uh, Phoenix. Some of them are going to Vegas. On the East Coast, a lot of people are heading to places like Atlanta because yep. there's lots of jobs being created there and the cost of living is very low. So if you want to make money and you're asking me, is such a such and such place a good market? It depends on, you have to kind of qualify that question a little bit more. But in general, if you go to the path of progress where people are heading to and you can get there before they figure out that's where they're going to, that's where the money is. And so I, I love buy and hold properties in Atlanta because there's so many people moving there. It's one of the most business friendly states in the US, Georgia. And they make it, it's, it's head office to Coca-Cola and Turner Broadcasting and Home Depot and FedEx. The list goes on and on and on of all these, uh, all these head offices that are in Atlanta. And that's because the government doesn't charge them much tax, knowing that these companies are gonna hire a whole bunch of employees with the money they're saving. And then they go tax all these employees. Well, the good news for us as landlords is if our, uh, if our tenant loses their job, at Coca-Cola, well, they can go work for, for Delta, or if they work for Delta, they can go to Turner Broadcasting. There's so many businesses opening up there all the time. So people will go there looking for work. So uh, obviously Florida, a lot of people go there. Uh, a lot of retirees like to go there, et cetera. But you know, once again, you need to, you need to kind of have your exit strategy set right. Because a lot of these people there, they're leaving places like New York with a lot of money and they're they're not buying the homes that most of us investors like to buy. They're not, a lot of them aren't renting. So you just need to have the right strategy for the right place. So Florida is a 
is it good? It's good for in some ways and in other ways, not as good. I, I, I'm not as big a fan of holding rental properties there. I, you know, right, right now with COVID, pretty much every market seems to be busy. But once COVID is over, will that, will that continue? I don't know. That's not where there's a lot of jobs. That's where the retirees are going. So once again, have the right exit strategy for the market you go into. But every market can be good if you have the right connections and the right exit strategy and the right ability to monetize it. So I would never say any market is totally bad or, or totally good. But make sure that you do your research and that the type of strategy that you want to do is going to be effective there. And if you see places where the population is shrinking drastically, like California, uh, is there's so many people leaving there. In New York, a lot of people leaving there. Uh, in, in general, I'd be very, very careful in those markets, but anywhere where people are moving to, that's where you want to go. Yeah. And that's this, that's like an economic fundamental behind investing in real estate. Job diversity, solid economy, um, just yeah, econo economic fundamentals. I, that's one of the reasons why I like I like Edmonton. It's more diverse than a lot of other places. Uh, Cologne has actually become a great, very very diverse economy. Believe it or not, Mike um, used to be a vacation place. Now it's tech hub. There's a construction boom. Um, the universities are expanding, so there are more and more diverse jobs. Tons of people are moving here because of COVID. Same reason that. That you were just talking about uh, that people are moving out of the big cities something interesting and i'll just comment on it and we don't need to expand on it much but wyoming tons of people are moving to wyoming from mm. washington washington and california tons of them yeah fair, er, er, this COVID is is creating some really surprising trends that who, who would have ever thought i mean wyoming idaho as a as a canadian the thought of somebody leaving california to head north is like so weird to me because uh, I'm, I'm just a sun worshiper. So maybe I'm looking at it yeah. from the wrong perspective. But if somebody five years ago would have said, hey, Idaho's going to boom, I would have said, you're crazy. But anyway, I'm wrong. So there you go. So don't listen to me because I am wrong sometimes too. There's cool pockets in Idaho. Coeur d'Alene is a lot like the Okanagan Valley. In fact, I think it's like an extension of the Okanagan Valley. But let's not get into it. Um, okay, great question. And I'm sure you're going to talk. Uh, I'm sure you can only talk so much about this. And folks, we don't want this to go too long uh, just because, you know, you don't want these kinds of things to go too, too long, but we'll do the best that we can. Um, how do you build a team from long distance? That's from Trina again. Another great question. Great question, Trina. So yeah. uh, the bet, there, there's numerous different ways. N number one is obviously when there's no COVID, you can, you can travel to the place. And I recommend quite often that you do that before you, I mean, you don't want to randomly just pick people without actually meeting them in person in general. Now, for me, it got really easy. Once, once you start to do a lot of deals, everybody wants to be on your team. So they will seek you out saying, oh, I hear you're coming to Atlanta and you're gonna be, you know, we've, we've sold, to give you some perspective, we sold around 1100 homes in Atlanta over the last nine years, uh, those turnkey properties. So everybody wants to be on our team. We get solicited every day. Now, when you're first starting out, much more difficult. So one of the great things is that A players tend to hang out with other great A players. So if you find, a really good realtor, they're not going to refer you to a really crappy property manager. And if you have a really good property manager, they're not going to refer you to really crappy tradespeople. The good people all hang out together. So quite often, you just need to find that one person and they can quite often fill in a lot of the, the missing pieces. So that's a good news. Uh, the other good news is we live really in the best times ever to be real estate investors. There's so much information at our fingertips on Google. We can read reviews on people. And so it's a lot easier than, than uh, you would think these days. Back in the days when I first started, that was definitely not, we didn't have, I mean, we had yellow pages. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, those, anyway, I won't go there. But uh, these days, we you can know. definitely, and, and the, there you go. The, the other thing is that I find that really successful investors, they tend to be, um, what's the word I'm looking at? Abundance minded. And so if somebody calls me up and says, hey, Mike, I need a roofer in Atlanta. Do you mind telling me who you use? I'd be happy to do that. I'm not going to, I don't, I don't have the scarcity mindset thinking, oh, well, if she uses my roofer, I won't be able to get any of my roofs done. So I think that, you know, going online and meeting other investors, you know, different forums online and seeing who they use in the market that you want to be in, uh, you know, that that's usually a pretty good indication. Most investors, if they're, if they can still afford to be investors, that means they're doing something right. So, so that's the good news. And then, you know, you can also, uh, one of the reasons why I do my turnkey properties 
is because you don't have to even build a team. It already comes with a team already pre-built. The homes are already fixed. There's tenants in place. My property management team is looking after it. I'm not the only one doing it. I'm not trying to sell you stuff, but I will, I will say that there's, be careful who you use, but there's definitely people out there that already have pre-assembled teams where you don't have to you know, build it yourself. It's already pre-existing and, and there for you. And you can skip a lot of steps by doing that. But I recommend if you're looking to do a big project on your own, once COVID lifts, then, then actually go and meet some people in person, see who uh, gives you good, a good feeling inside. I usually use my gut instincts, not my brain anymore, because that always this always, for some reason, if, if this and this are in not in alignment, this is always right. And so see who, who gives you a good feeling and pick the right people. And quite often, if you find that one, like I said, that one good person, they can get you a whole bunch of other great people to fill in whatever you need. Yeah, I think it's like the Pareto principle or something like that. Um, usually 20% of your business comes, no, uh, like 90% of your business comes yeah. from 20% of your yeah. contacts or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah, so um, here's, all right, I've got um, how much from Alan, how much does an average bungalow rent for in Atlanta? Well, that's that's a really tough question because much like, well, Kelowna is a pretty small place, but if you go to most major cities that, that are big, if, if, I'm going to talk about Calgary since I know it. If you were to go, I don't know how many are, are familiar with Calgary, but if you go to Mount yeah, Royal, well, which, uh, talk about Calgary or Edmonton, it would be fine. Yeah, know, so, if, yeah, yeah. So if you well put it this way, every every city has this really nice areas, and every especially in the states, every city has the war zone. In Canada, we don't really get the war zones. We have some not as pleasant neighborhoods, but nothing compared to what you see in the U.S. So when we talk average, uh, it, it's it's very hard to answer that question. But I'll tell you that our, our average property that I resell already fixed up is probably around $150,000. And they start as low as $80,000. This is all US, this is all single family homes. And you know, an average, it's just so hard to say what an average bungalow uh, would would rent for because it, it varies so much by community. So instead of average, I'd, I'd just say on, on average, our, our properties in Atlanta, they net after property management fees and taxes and insurance, et cetera, our, our clients are netting around 7% per year. So 100,000 should net you around 7,000 after your expenses. But the really big win is in the appreciation. When you have a city like that, like to me, the thought of an $80,000 home fixed up in a major city with 5 million people in a half decent neighborhood for 80,000 bucks, I feel like I've gone back to 1960. I wasn't even born in 1961. I was born in 65. I feel like I was, I'm one year old looking at real estate prices, but I know what's going to happen. It's like, I've read the book. I know the end of the story. There's going to be no such thing as an $80,000 home. Not that many years from now, there shouldn't be like that. That to me is like, if, if I, if I went to fill up my car with gas and it was like 12 cents a liter, it's like, what? I feel like I've gone back in time. So when we're looking at a city where there's lots of jobs being created and lots of people moving there, to me, there's only one thing that's going to happen. And that, that the market like that, the rent is going to continue to go up. The prices are going to continue to go up. And as more and more people start to realize, hey, why are, and people are waking up in California now. That's why they're all leaving. They say, why are we, we're sitting on these properties. They didn't, a lot of them didn't pay what they're, what they're selling for now. It's like, we could sell our home and live happily ever after somewhere else and not have to worry about working and not have to worry about all the things that we used to worry about. We can have a really good life if we just, sell this thing, we could buy an even nicer home in this other market, have a nicer place and not have any payments. And so people sometimes wake up and say, hey, this is a really good deal. Why are we renting when we could be owning? And I don't even think I'm answering the, the original question, but I get excited. And oh, eventually these no. markets go up. That's all I'm saying. So but I don't Alan's, know a lot. Alan's a smart guy. He knows how to- He knows what I, I'm saying. I, I, everybody, he can reverse engineer all those numbers you just talked about. I know he can. There smart you go. Cookie. Y'all, y'all on here are very smart people. I know that. Well, first of all, because you're here. All right. So there's one, I think we're going to have this be the last question because I know that Mike wants to uh, share with you an opportunity to spend three days with him and you all get a discount and it's pretty exciting. And um, full disclosure, if you all buy, he's going to give some of it to me. And if you all buy the big thing, he's also going to give some of it to me. And, and if you um, buy, Julie knows where you all live. So she's going to show well, up on your doorstep. No, so. no, <laughs> no, I won't. But um, 
it's just okay for us to talk about that. Mike and I were talking about that before we started today. I want to help him. I want to help all of you. And I don't mind getting some help back. And I just think the more that people uh, feel that way, it's just like the roofer. Like I'm going to, I want to, I, I want to help you and I don't mind getting help back. And there's, and we live in an abundant world. And I hope this helps with each and every one of your abundance. So just wanted to be full disclosure right there. But the question, the great question is, um, can you, and I, I think I know the answer, but are you able to, to use registered funds from Canada, like RSPs, TFSAs, Liras in the US? I wish and I could I say yes. I wish yeah. that was the case, but I'd be lying. You um, cannot. However, let's say you had equity in, in a property you owned in Canada. You could borrow somebody else's RSP money or Lira and uh, register it against your property, then use that money for anything you like, including US investing. So, so that's one answer. The other answer is you can do what I did. And back when Vegas, when I first started in Vegas, it was such a tremendous opportunity. And I didn't just want to sell every single one of my Canadian properties. So I actually cashed in my RSPs and I paid the tax on it. And once again, sometimes things sting for a few minutes, but then I've turned over that money over and over and over again. I made a lot of money and a lot more than it ever would have made sitting in an RSP with such, in Canada, we have such limited options, unfortunately. And it makes me sad that, you know, I can invest in GICs, which don't keep up with inflation and that's considered safe, uh, but, and I can invest in mutual funds. Don't even, I'm not even going to go there. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but that's another uh, webinar. Yeah. But we can't, but yeah, but we can't invest in real estate with our money, even in, in Canada. I mean, there's ways to do it, but it's tricky. So, so the answer is no, you cannot. But once I started investing in states, I just liquidated that money. I paid the tax. You're not really paying it. It was deferred because at one point I saved money by putting the money in there and then I have to pay it back. And then I took that money and I, I've used, I, I can't even tell you how much money I've made by not having it in my RSPs. And uh, so that's the, the other way to do it. But in general, no, you can't keep it registered and buy US real estate with it, unfortunately. Well, it's like the concept of seed money. That's what a seed is. You bury it in the ground, it becomes a tree, and then the apples fall down and more seeds happen. And then more trees come up and on and on and on and on and on. So yeah, you kind of, if you can think of it that way, then I hope that helps. Um, all right, we've run out of amazing questions. Thank you everybody for your participation. I didn't even hardly use any of mine. I sent you a whole right. bunch, right, Mike? <laughs> yeah, you, you had. A, I know you had a bunch of them, and and I'm of course I, I'm happy to answer. If anybody had any questions that didn't get covered today, shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer each and every question. I want you to uh, have all the all the proper information in case this is something you're looking to do. I'm happy to help you with it. Yeah, so I've put Mike's email in the chat. Anybody watching this recording, it's somewhere around here. It's in this email. It's in this post. If you can't find it, then reach out to find me. And I will, I will totally help you. Um, the other thing that I put into the chat are some offers that uh, Mike's going to talk about. One of them I know is free. And then, at the and then um, I also am going to share something with you as well that that's an extra special bonus if you ask me. Um, and Mike called it brilliant, so that's big. Um, uh, Mike, why don't you just get right into your three day? Let's talk about that. What people are going to get out of it? I'm sure it's going to be amazing, and I want to know more. So let's get into that. All right, so uh, I can tell you that before COVID, I was, uh, I, I still am semi-nomadic. I was 100% nomadic. I was basically traveling around full-time. My teams do almost every, everything. My rental properties are managed by other people. I don't deal with them ever, nothing. I don't get calls. It's all handled for me. And then my turnkey properties in Atlanta, once again, I got teams. They do 90% of the work. It's my money, my systems, my teams, but it's very little of my time. And I used to do one or two events a year. I do live events. I take people to Houston, Texas, for example. I teach them how to do tax deeds over four days. And then when the four days would end, I would hop on an airplane and go somewhere tropical, kind of like where I am now. This is my happy place, the sun and the sand. And then COVID hit and I actually went back to Calgary for seven months, which is the longest that I've uh, been in Canada for probably six years now. And the first couple of weeks I was back there, I was like super lazy because I had no flights to catch and nothing on my agenda. So I was sleeping in and watching Netflix like everybody else. And then I started to get calls from people, some of them my friends who are normally very 
strong people saying, hey, my business just shut down, or I just lost my job. And uh, anyway, I was noticing a lot of people were, were going through a lot of transition, a lot of tough times. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, because I started getting a lot of calls, I actually wrote an ebook, uh, which I'm going to give you for free. It talks about some of the things you can do. And it was meant really for all these people that are losing jobs and they don't, they're, they're uh, you know, their businesses are shutting down. And so I wanted to show people, well, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can get into real estate. Have you ever thought about being a real estate investor? And some of these are, are strategies that involve little or no cash. And there are things you can do, even if you're locked down, a lot of them you do from a computer, you don't have to leave home. And so that's how it started. And then a, a friend of mine called me up and she runs summits, uh, but she teaches wealth creation, but she doesn't actually teach uh, real estate. That's not her forte. So she said, Mike, can you come speak on my, my podcast? And I did much like this. It was like supposed to be 45 minutes and then Q and A. And her people had a lot of questions. She said, Mike, can you do an, a, another event just for my people? Maybe like for an afternoon. And I said, sure. So I make a long story short, by the time all is said and done, she talked me into doing a three-day summit of my own for her people. And so the, the original summit was probably about 10 months ago. And I charged $997 for it. And we got amazing feedback and people really enjoyed it. And I loved it. I, I found out that I could actually sit in front of my computer for three days and teach and, and it was fun and interactive. And I really enjoyed it. I didn't know if I could do that, uh, but we got great reviews, but some people said, oh, well, I can't, you know, I just lost my job. I can't afford 997 bucks. So I did a second one and I think we charged 247 for it. Uh, but anyway, to make a long story short, I've decided I want to make this accessible to everybody. So for three days of training, I've made it $97 and I'm actually giving a further discount because you're uh, here, with, here with us tonight and, and uh, on Julie's program. So I'm actually giving, we're, we're going to give you a $50 off coupon. So it's $47 for three days of training. And I'm going to be teaching basically the stuff that I put in my ebook. You're going to get that for free and then some, because we have three days together. So I'm going to talk about tax liens and deeds. I'm going to talk about wholesaling, overages, flipping, you name it, all these different strategies you can do. A lot of them pertain to both Canada and the U.S. Uh, most of them you can do in, if you just don't want to just invest in Canada, you can. Uh, but this is stuff that you can do, like I said, even if you're in a place where they're, you're not even allowed out of your home, uh, if you don't have a whole lot of cash, you can still do this stuff. And so I, I just really want to inspire as many people as possible because I know that there's so many people going through tough times. And so 2020 was kind of the year that I wanted to get as much information out there as possible. And now since COVID is still here and people still aren't, uh, things are not back to normal, I'm probably going to do one or two more of these three-day summits. Uh, but after that, I, you know, I plan to get back to, I have two grandkids, so I want to travel with them. Hopefully if borders start to open up again, and I do a lot of volunteering and there's a lot of things that I love that are very fulfilling to me and teaching is very fulfilling to me, but I'm recording all this. So eventually we'll sell the recordings and I probably won't teach live that much anymore. But uh, anyway, for uh, March 12th to 14th, which should be a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, that's that's gonna be my next event. I'd love to have you all there, it's 47 bucks. And uh, I'm gonna teach you as much as I possibly can over three days. And um, uh, I'd, I'd be honored to have you all there, so. That's awesome. Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, pretty straightforward. I like that. There wasn't a huge buildup and you weren't making us all run around for our credit cards and no it's not, none of that i, I want to help people that want my help i, I yeah. i'm not here to pressure anybody to do anything they don't want yeah. to do and you know and and, and also i do want i want to make you know there's gonna be some americans on the call so it's not gonna be all hey if you're canadian here's how you invest in the us but i'm happy to answer all of those questions during that or even right you know just send me an email I'm happy to answer those for you too but a lot of these strategies go hand in hand. I mean, if you learn, uh, if the things that are stopping you are that you're afraid, oh, how do I deal with the taxes? I can help you with that. If you're wondering, how do I get money to invest the states? I can help you with that. If you're wondering, how do I bring my money back? Uh, how do I exchange my currency? Whatever it is, I can help you with all those things. So if that's the stuff that's holding you back from investing in the US, I can help you. If you only want to invest in Canada still, I can help you with that too. But the point is, I'm there to help people. If you need help, if you want help, I'm happy to share what I've learned. I'm going to bring uh, some guest speakers teaching some of the strategies that I don't personally do. Uh, and uh, my goal is to help as many people as possible be successful with real estate investing. It's been so 
good to me. And I, I know so many people have tried it and they, they didn't succeed because either they had the wrong uh, training or uh, I, I find some, some of the trainers make this stuff really complicated. None of the stuff is rocket science. So I'm not really that smart. I didn't even make it to law school. So I'm not really, uh, I'm not dumb, but I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, some genius. And that's why I'm successful. I'm successful. One, because I didn't want to tell my mother she was right. And I, I didn't want to go back at that second degree. That's part of it. But the, the bigger thing is, you know, I, I figure this stuff out. I like to jump in, figure it out. And then I like to teach other people what I've learned and show them how to not make the mistakes that I made. Because in real estate, you know, and, and you know this, Julie, too, uh, when you make mistakes, they can be very, very expensive. Uh, I learned that the hard way very early on in my career. And, you know, I, that's why I hired that mentor not long after that. If I was smart and a little bit more humble and not as egotistical back in the day, I would have hired the mentor before getting into the next property. But uh, anyway, we live and we learn. But that's why I, lo I love teaching. And I just know so many people are going through really tough times right now. And so I love to teach uh, not, not just how to invest and make money. That's, that's important. It's awesome. But also how to help these other people that are going to be in trouble that are pre-foreclosure. They're going to lose their, potentially lose their homes and be in a really bad spot. I want to show people how you can give them kind of a, a better outlook, a better future and monetize it for yourself, but also help them. And that's what I love about real estate is to me, I don't even, I don't even like the term real estate investor. I like the term problem solvers because we go out there and we help these people that are uh, in a tough spot and put them in a better spot and we get paid for it. What could be more rewarding than that? And that's why I still love what I do. Even after this many years, I still wake up excited to do what I do. So that's a long way of saying I'd love to have you all there and I can't wait to work with whoever uh, whoever comes there, but I'm not, uh, Julie might show up at your door. I won't, uh, but uh, we'd love to have you there. Yeah, no, I won't show up at your door. I promise you guys, I, you get, I, I, I uh, just, I, I'm like Mike, I want to help you get to where you're going and I want to show you as many vehicles as possible, really, um, because that's what it's all about. Some people uh, one vehicle works for them and and for some it, i don't know i just can't get the, the darn thing to run you know what i mean so uh maybe this is it i hope so if not we you know that's okay too um and, and you know i i want to answer john's question i did it was hiding in here do you mind if we have one more question here yeah, absolutely yeah I'm, I'm i'm i've got nothing else to do after this so it, it's a really good question because it speaks to the 1031 um exchanges mm. which i believe and let me let me guess and see if this is correct but there's um uh the 1031 tax exchange where you don't pay taxes on an investment as long as you buy another investment with it am i right that that's what that is yeah so the 1031 exchange is in the in the us if you sell uh, an investment, and then you invest in a like investment, meaning if you sell uh, a piece of real estate and you want to buy some more real estate with it, you won't pay a capital gains tax on it gets deferred. Now, if you sell a bunch of stocks to buy real estate, you will pay tax. So uh, the 1031 exchange to answer your, your question, can Canadians do it? Uh, there are ways that Canadians can do it. If you buy in your personal name, you cannot because the US will say, yeah, no problem. You can do the Of course you can do a 1031 exchange. And then you're going to do your tax return in Canada and the CRA is going to say, oh, well, we don't recognize a 1031 exchange. That's not, we don't have a 1031 exchange. And then even though you didn't pay a dime to the U.S. government, Canada is going to take a whole bunch of that money away from you. So there are, there are ways to deal with that and to do it. Uh, you definitely don't want to buy in your personal name. Uh, that kind of goes beyond the scope of how you do it because we'd be here for a long, long time. Yeah. But uh, there's definitely cross-border accountants that can teach you. And also when you're setting up your structure, you want to be mindful of that to make sure you can take advantage of certain things. Uh, so, uh, so the answer is, is yes, there are, there are ways that Canadians can take advantage of it, but you have to be careful how you purchase it. If you buy in your personal name or anything where CRA uh, eventually uh, gets to the CRA and it shows up on your Canadian tax return, uh, even though the U.S. is happy to let you do it, the uh, Canadian government will not, unfortunately. Basically, strategy and work with your team. Make sure you got the right people on your team advising you to do it the right way. Absolutely, that, that's that's really the key is to have the right people on your team and help. You know, one of the best ways uh, I, I think a lot of people say, "Oh, well, that's an expense." That's not an expense. A good a good accountant is saving you more money than what you're paying them. A good lawyer is making you more money than what you're paying them. So having the right people on your team is invaluable 
Now, having the wrong people on your team, that's going to give you the opposite effect, but having those right people. And that's, that's why I love sharing, you know, the people that, uh, that I've tested my, that I've worked with myself that I know are good and reliable. And, uh, I'm happy to, I'm happy to share any resources with your, with your folks uh, anytime. So. Awesome. That is so good. And then there was another part to this question where, um, and this is probably an accounting question I'm going to guess, and you probably won't be able to get into, into detail, duty too much detail, but how does holding us properties affect estate planning? when you want to leave your wealth to your Canadian kids. That's yeah. definitely a cross-border accounting question. Probably okay. I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you once again that I'm not an accountant, not yeah. a lawyer, not a anything. No. I'm not but, anything. But, really. but a good question. Like, it's still a good question. It's a great question, but I will tell you my understanding of it. So right. imagine I had a U.S. corporation that owned my different real estate holdings. And let's say I made my daughter... Uh, Part of that company. She was on that company. Well, the company's not going to die. If I pass away, that company is still going to be in, in existence. If Walmart, uh, if the uh, if John uh, John Walton or whatever his name is, if the Walton dude dies, Walmart's not going to shut down. It's going to continue to exist. So your company will continue to exist. And as long as those assets don't get disposed of, and once again, I'm not a lawyer. I can be totally off on this. My understanding is that if my daughter is, for example, on that corporation, well, she'll just take over the role and we'll continue to do business as usual. I can also tell you that there's different types of trusts where you can make the beneficiary of that trust somebody else and leave it to them. So I believe there's a number of ways to deal with that. I haven't died yet. And so I'm, and I haven't gone to, I didn't go to law school. You guys know that about me. So I didn't make it. But um, my understanding is that there, there are ways around it. Uh, that are strategic, but definitely check with a an estate planner and lawyer and a cross border accountant and whoever uh, is applicable for what you want to do. And that's my that's my understanding of all, all that uh, legal mumbo jumbo. I think that's a good example, and it, and I know it's definitely helpful for me because I don't even I, well no I I know some about that because my, my my daddy lives in Denver, uh, and and we do this thing and this is probably morbid but we call it the drill and we pretend like he's incapacitated and make sure we know where everything is so that everything can be handled properly and um, i think it's actually something really smart for people to do whether yeah. you're canadian or, or, or american as long as you know everybody can kind of handle it emotionally but let me tell you what things get real emotional when people pass away so that's another seminar i think yeah. we had six <laughs> side seminars within this Exactly. Webinar. That's right. It's good to cover a lot of bases and a lot of ground. Yeah. It's more fun. It is. It is. So, um, all right, guys, there are links in the chat. It's going to come your way on email as well. You have Mike's email address. Take advantage of this free book, please. Take advantage of the, uh, there's a promo code so that you get $50 off the three day, three whole days with Mike and, and all of the smart people that surround him. That's amazing. And there's one more thing in there, and it's a goodie from me. Uh, what, I, what I have done is I put together a way for you to raise money from somebody else to, in order to take advantage of coaching, in order to take advantage of courses. Because let's just face it, a lot of times there's a financial barrier. You pro Probably none of you have a financial barrier to $50 for three days. But there's going to be another offer because that's how these things work. And it's a great way, it, and it's how Mike gets to continue to help people just like each and every one of you. So let's do our best to remove that financial barrier, shall we? What I have done is I put together a presentation that you can just copy, use, put, uh, replace my information, because I designed it so people could take my coaching and people could sign up for my courses. But Take the, the PowerPoint, which you're going to get, as and it's for free. All, you got, all I need is your email. Um, you're going to get uh, the PowerPoint, and you can use it, again, for Mike's stuff. You're going to get an example of how to do the presentation so that you can actually create a win-win with somebody else to help uh, take advantage of the investment in yourself, to take advantage of Mike's uh, bigger, bigger offer that's coming your way. And... Uh, you're also going to get uh, something that you're going to need anyway if you're going to try to try to do this strategy, which is basically raising money from somebody else to help pay for courses and coaching. 
uh, which is a loan agreement. You're gonna wanna have a proper loan agreement in place. So um, I put a link in there. It's streetsmartdiva.com forward slash cash for coaching or cash for cor courses. I can't remember what I called it, but it's in the link or sorry, it's in the chat and it's somewhere on this email if you're watching this email or it's somewhere on this post if you're watching this post. And if you can't find it, just message me. I will get it to you, okay? Because um, just like what Mike's doing by you know making something that was once a thousand dollars now basically fifty bucks, uh, and he offered me to offer it to you guys. By the way, this is how generous he is for like a dollar. And I, you know, the more you, the more you pay, the more you pay attention. And um, even if it means you're using somebody else's money to do that, so um, take advantage of this offer. And I hope that uh, uh, the it's called the deal partner presentation for coaching. I hope that helps you. I really, really do. I know that it works because I, I did this um, at an event to help pay for a course that, course that we've put on. And one guy actually came forward. He said, if anybody wants me to help them pay for their coaching, I'm smart. I like making money. I'll be their deal partner. And we got 10 people paid for the course by using this strategy. So it definitely works. And it's definitely a win-win. It's a lot of fun. So I hope you get a lot of, out of that. Um, Mike, anything else to say before we get off? Yeah, I just want to say, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And thanks for all, you have great, uh, the audience had great questions. So I want to thank yeah. them for that. And uh, make sure, I don't know if you noticed, but Julie also put a link to my free ebook that talks yeah. about some of the strategies you can do right now. So go check that out for sure. Yep. And uh, it's absolutely free and uh if you, for some reason you can't make it to my three day, at least read the ebook. That'll at least give you a, uh, hopefully a little bit of inspiration. And uh, once again, my, uh, if you're friends with Julie, my, uh, the channels are open to me too. If you have any questions anytime, uh, feel free to reach out. You have my email address. So shoot me an email. Let me know what you're, if you're stuck with something, I'm more than happy to help you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mike. I really appreciate it. I know everybody else does too. We had almost everybody stay on to the very end. So I know people, couple of people probably just had to hop, hop, hop off because they thought it'd maybe be done earlier. But hey, it was such great information. They'll probably listen to the recording. Um, thanks again for your generosity. And thank you each and every one of you for either listening or being here. And uh, we'll see everybody next time. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. See you later, everyone.